What's up everybody, Patrick here. We're about to begin a new test. And the first question that we have on the test is we have to state the domain and range of each of these relations. There's actually two more relations after these three, but I just wrote out the first three to save room on the whiteboard. Now notice how all of these relations, they're all transformations of parent functions. And you can go through the process of graphing these with the transformation algorithm. So finding the A, K, D, C values, mapping them, et cetera, et cetera. But by this point, you should be pretty comfortable with making a rough sketch of each of these. And then from that rough sketch, you can find what the domain and range is. So let's start off with this first one. So with this relation, y equals negative bracket x minus 2 squared plus 4, you can tell that this is a parabola, right? Because the parent function is y equals x squared. And you should be able to tell that the vertex is at a coordinate 2 and 4. Now 2 and 4 is right here. And because the a value is negative, this parabola is opening down. And when it comes to the parent function y equals x squared, any transformation of it, if you're finding the domain and range, all you have to know is the location of the vertex and whether it's opening up or down. Then you can find the domain and range. So the domain of this relation is going to be what? Well, the domain of any parabola is always x is an element of real numbers because it just keeps going on forever and every x value gets hit on this relation here. So there's no restriction on the domain. What about the range? Well, there's always a restriction on the range. y can be an element of real numbers. However, y has to be less than or equal to 4 in this case. So the restriction on the range for a parabola always depends on whether the parabola is opening up or down, in this case it's opening down, and on the y value of the vertex, right? So all of the y values in this case have to be less than or equal to 4. Let's move on to the next one, y equals 3 over x plus 3. Notice how this is a transformation of the parent function 1 over x, the reciprocal function. So, how are we transforming it? Well, this x plus 3 means we are moving it 3 units to the left. And if you remember, 1 over x has a vertical asymptote at x is equal to 0. Well, if we move it 3 units to the left, well now, this graph is going to have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to negative 3. This 3 up here is the a value, so it just means that it's been vertically stretched. That doesn't tell us too much with a reciprocal function. Now, what we also want to look for with reciprocal functions is the location of the horizontal asymptote. And we know 1 over x has a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to 0. And if the function has been transformed up or down, if there's a c value, then that means that horizontal asymptote gets transformed as well or translated up or down. However, notice that there isn't any c value here. It's just zero. So we know that the horizontal asymptote is still going to stay at y is equal to zero. So basically, we're just taking 1 over x, which looks like this. We are stretching it a bit, which doesn't make a huge difference, and then we are shifting it three units to the left. So this new function is going to look something like this, roughly. Right? So the most important things with reciprocal functions is knowing where the vertical asymptote is. Well, we know it's at x is equal to negative 3 and knowing where the horizontal asymptote is. It's at y is equal to 0. Now, if I had like a minus... I don't know, 2 here, for example, then this whole function would be shifted down by 2, and there would be a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to negative 2. So just be aware of that. It wasn't shifted up or down, though, so the horizontal asymptote still stays at y is equal to 0. And now we can get into figuring out what the domain and range is. Well, the domain for a reciprocal function is always x is an element of real numbers, but x cannot equal that negative 3, that vertical asymptote. 
And that makes sense because if we plug in negative 3 into this function, notice how the denominator will be 0. Can't divide anything by 0. What about the range? Well, the range of a reciprocal is always y is, is an element of real numbers, but y cannot equal the horizontal asymptote. We said the horizontal asymptote is at 0. And that's the domain and range for this function. So whenever you're dealing with a reciprocal function, the domain and range is always in this format where x cannot equal the vertical asymptote and y cannot equal the horizontal asymptote. So really all you have to figure out with a reciprocal function is where's the vertical asymptote, right? So what x value makes the denominator equal to zero? And where is the horizontal asymptote? What is that c value there? c value is zero, so the horizontal asymptote was at zero. And then what about this next function, y equals 3 sine x minus 2? Probably these functions are the ones that we've gotten the least practice with. So when we dealt with uh, these periodic functions, we said that you should always start off with the axis, which depends on the c value. So we should start off with this negative 2. That would be here. So we know that this function is going to be alternating with this negative 2 sort of in the middle of that wave. And then the amplitude of that wave is going to be 3. So we know the max point is going to be negative 2 plus 3, which is going to be at positive 1. So we could draw a dotted line there. And then the minimum of this function is going to be negative 2 minus 3, which is going to be at negative 5. So we could draw a dotted line there. And then since this is a sine graph, it's starting at the axis, and it's just going to look like this. It's going to keep alternating. So we don't need to know too many specifics. All you need to know, really, with these periodic functions, with the parent function sine x or cos x, is basically where the max and the min is. And the way you get that is the c value, which represents the axis, plus or minus that amplitude. And then you know where this uh, function, what values it is fluctuating in between. So now we can figure out what the domain and range is. Well, the domain of a function like this, of a periodic function, is always going to be x is an element of real numbers. Notice how this wave goes on forever. There's no restrictions on x. But the range... It's going to be y is an element of real numbers, but again, it's going to depend on that max and min value because that's what the y values are going to be always fluctuating in between. So the way the range looks for a function like this is that the y values have to be greater than or equal to negative 5, the min value, but less than or equal to 1, which is the max value. So the domain of a periodic function for a parent function sine x, whether it's just the parent function or whether it's been transformed, that is always x e r. And then the range is always y e r, but y has to be in between the min and max value. In this case, it's negative 5 and 1. And then working on the last two, so we got y is equal to the square root of x minus 5 plus 4. Notice how the parent function for this one is what y is equal to the square root of x, right? The radical function, which looks like this. Well, how are we transforming this parent function into this function? Well, this minus 5, that means the d value is positive 5, so we're moving it 5 units to the right, and then we're moving it 4 units up. The c value is 4. So we're going to move this 5 units to the right and then 4 units up, so now this function is going to look something like that, where this point here is 5 and 4. And now it's easy for us to figure out what the domain and range is. So let's start off with the domain. Notice how x can be anything as long as x is greater than this value of 5, greater than or equal to 5, right? Because if it's 5, then this is going to be 0, and then the y value is going to be 4. It's going to represent this point. Notice how x can't be anything less than 5, because if x is anything less than 5, 
if you plug it in here, like let's say you plug in 4, 4 minus 5 gives you negative 1, can't square root a negative number. So that's the domain. The range is what? The y values can be anything, but they have to be greater than or equal to 4. So when you're, whenever you're dealing with this y equals square root x function, the domain and range are heavily dependent on where that, uh, I don't even know the name for it, let's just call it like a vertex, this vertex is. So here it was at 0 and 0 for the parent function, but what we did was we transformed it 5 units to the right, 4 units up. So let me actually just erase the parent function just so you're not uh, getting confused here. So this here is the graph of this function. Now you got to be careful as well with any negatives. There were no negatives given here, but let's say there was like a negative 1 in front. Well then this function would look like this. And the domain would still be the same. All the x values still have to be greater than or equal to 5, but the y values would be less than or equal to 4. So this would be switched around. Also, if there was a negative inside, so instead of just the square root of x minus 5, let's say it was like negative square root of x minus 5. Well, now the k values negative 1 means it's been reflected in the y-axis, then this function would be going this way. And the range would still be the same. All the y values have to be greater than or equal to 4, but the domain would be different all the x values have to be less than or equal to 5. So just be careful with functions that you get like that, where the a value is negative, that means it's been reflected in the x-axis, like this, or if the k value is negative, been reflected in the y-axis, so it will go that way. Or both, if the a value and the k value would be negative, then this function would look something like that, right? And then the domain and range would both be affected. So just be aware of that with that square root of x parent function, all the different transformations and how the domain and range is affected. And then our last one, uh, x is equal to y squared. We've already gone over this many times. Basically, the way this is going to look, if you make a table of values for this, it's just going to be a sideways parabola. It's basically the inverse of y is equal to x squared. So you could take the table of values for y equals x squared and then just switch, interchange the x and y values, plot those points, you end up getting this here. And what's the domain going to be of this relation? This is not a function, notice, it's just a relation because it doesn't pass the vertical line test, right? There's multiple y values per x value. So domain is what? X has to be greater than or equal to zero. So X can be anything as long as X is greater than or equal to zero. And then what about the range? Well, there's no restrictions on the Y's. Notice how this sideways parabola will just keep going on forever. Y can be anything. And notice how the domain and range are switched from the domain and range of um, Y is equal to X squared right? Because they're just inverses of each other. So that's the domain and range for that relation. Yo, what's up guys? Thanks for checking out my channel. Hopefully you got some value from the video you just watched. If you did get some value, big favor to ask you, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. Any questions, any recommendations on things you'd like to see, please leave it in the comments section. Also check out the description box below for links to material and content related to the video you just watched. Peace out.